the first question to ask is why is it that we're, we're talking about this now? This is something that is big in the news. It has all of the media navel gazers rending garments um, and uh, swearing up and down. Um, I think it might have something to do with a election, maybe, <laughs> somewhere uh, in North America, perhaps, um, and it has come right to the forefront of the sort of discourse about what, what is real and how we can trust uh, what's, uh, what we're seeing, and um, has made a lot of people think about how it is that we're seeing it. Um, and it's become a hyper-partisan issue, right? Uh, it's fallen, you know, it starts in politics, but is now kind of in the, in the wider narrative about how we're getting the information that we get. Um, and fake news, the phrase which I will condemn by the end of this, has kind of taken on uh, a life of its own. Um, yesterday, for example, um, Prime Minister suggested that there were some um, fake claims uh, about a, a certain uh, a certain promise that she made, um, but she herself was making something of a fake claim about the fake claims. Um, it, it's just it's become sort of irresistibly useful for politicians, for ad men of various sorts, to uh, to sort of fall back on that phrase. You can just sort of kill the discussion simply by saying, fake news, that's it, with the exclamation point, possibly followed by sad. Um, but, I mean, it's not just limited to American politics or, or indeed to UK politics. Um, it's, it's just too easy to, to, to fall back on this. So we're seeing this sort of spread far and wide. And it is, according to some people, a frankly disgusting practice. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you to, uh, to assert um, that it is not a new thing, um, and I'm going to spend a great deal of time, in the audience of the questions that I have posed in the program, I'm going to spend a great deal of time uh, talking about how it is not a new thing. So, have a look at this quote, um, and I'm going to assert that as long as there have been mass media, there have been you know, attempts to, to manipulate it. Um, this quote is in reply to one John Norville, who was asking uh, someone for advice. Um, he was a newspaper editor, he wanted to know how better to run a newspaper. And he asked it of a sitting president, one Thomas Jefferson, 1807. This is old, old news, old fake news. How troubling, then, that a, that a president should be calling out fake news like that. Um, as, the, as the penny press grew in the, um, the 1830s, uh, newspapers started to adopt advertising-centered business models. Remember that phrase, we're going to come back to it. Um, there were much larger audiences than the sort of highbrow stuff that had been printed up to that point. Um, and that meant that they needed to get bigger audiences in. And it was kind of it was the beginning of the economics of uh, what we call commercially-minded sensationalism. Um, and that, in turn, sparked some spectacular fakes. If you want to sell more papers by telling spectacular stories, then you might, like the New York Sun did, do a six-part series, Great Astronomical Discoveries Lately Made, about the discovery of life on the moon. Mm -hmm. It sold papers. Um, it troubled one Edgar Allan Poe. Um, what troubled him more, though, was that <coughs> he tried to go around telling people, hey, everybody, this is fake news, sad. But no one would listen. He couldn't find an audience. Um, it's, uh, it's a telling example, right? Um, and we're going to come back to this as well, the idea of even though people know it's fake, they don't react in the way that you might like, right? The sanctity of, of facts seemed to be crumbling. It was like the end of the world. Um, and I suppose my kind of take on all of that is that this often follows changes in modes of communication, right? Uh, nothing so changed the news industry as the invention of the telegraph. People were used to getting papers and hearing about stuff that had happened weeks or even months ago, depending on how far away they were. Um, with the invention of telephone, then, with, with radio, with television, every time, great consternation about how this is kind of changing the discourse that we have. The fakes went on. Um, I mean, I, I would buy that paper. I, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Terrible scenes of mutilation shown in goofy cartoon form. <laughs> this carried on, um, and it wasn't just um, in New York, though, that kind of, uh, the, the battles in New York between Hearst and Pulitzer kind of became famous uh, for, for exactly this kind of stuff, and the more salacious stuff, actually. Um, but uh, it was actually quite uh, prominent also in Germany. Um, again, printing technology and paper got, uh, got cheaper. There were more papers proliferating, everybody kind of covering the same ground, there's only so much news to do. Um, some papers were kind of rich, they had enough money to send people out to be foreign correspondents, others didn't, but faked it. Um, so much so, um, that they have uh, so widespread with the practice that it, it developed its own name, uh, my German is terrible, but on the order of Unecta Correspondence, fake correspondence letter. So what we're seeing here is one of the masters of the art, um, basically <coughs> clippings from existing news stories, 
kind of rewritten here, thrown in some color, invented some people, you know, uh, the tears of the affected and, and what have you. Um, again, all of this to say this has been going on for some time. But all of this was really about selling newspapers. What we're worried about these days is the stuff that is that is misdirection, that is, uh, is trying to, to, you know, to alter the civic discourse, um, not just about selling papers. It's about people like this guy, masterfully making stuff up to influence elections, right? It's more than that, of course, we're going to you know, get on to, to the science end of it, um, but uh, the, the, the concerns that arose then, the kind of that's, that uh, people started to notice about the sort of sociology of this stuff, here again, not new. Once the newspaper obtains access to the press wires, this ingenious series of tubes that carried information practically instantaneously across the land is a dangerous stuff in 1925. Our man before that was uh, making up on the completely sort of made-up news website has access to the press wires. We all have access to the press wires. We have the power to read from anybody and to broadcast to anybody, and this comes with its own problems. Um, but I'll wind back a little bit. Um, to, to the yellow journalism business. The, the focus of, on impartiality, uh, let's remember, is kind of new in the news business. Um, it uh, arose uh, as a backlash against the yellow journalism of the sort of late 19th century, again with uh, Hearst and, and Pulitzer. Um, it, the business of people just fighting for readers by, by you know, increasingly salacious stuff in their pages. All of this has, I, it just strikes me that this is just cycles and epicycles of the same thing that we're going through now. Um, another thing we notice, uh, Leon Festinger was a, uh, was a psychologist, he's the one who coined the phrase uh, cognitive dissonance. did a study by providing some, some participants with uh, fake news about Mars, um, and then sort of asking them questions about it afterwards. Uh, and then later in 1957 wrote this book, uh, <coughs> uh, When Prophecy Fails. This is actually what's troubling. This is actually kind of what, as a journalist, makes me sort of, you know, uh, twitch and lose sleep, is this idea of even when confronted with the facts, what we find, in particular in a preponderance of information, is that that only serves to reinforce biases people already have. So we have, you know, throw a little pop psychology in here, you know, we have conf confirmation biases and so on, but, but this particular, this almost pathological, no, I, I don't, no, I, I don't believe you, is, uh, is a really hard thing to come up against. Um, <coughs> And it takes a lot of forms. I thought, I thought about doing a, um, a kind of uh, taxonomy of fake news, and the stuff that is outright fabricated, and the stuff that's opinion masquerading as fact, and the stuff that's advertorial, and so on. I don't think it's actually all that useful. I think the, the sort of the underlying forces here are probably the same um, in terms of what's happening in the reader's head. Um, but let's take a more recent example. Saturday again about um, terrorism. Does, does everybody remember this? Did anybody see this? Everybody saw this. Okay. So this was read out um, on no less a radio program than today by Nick Robinson. Um, it turns out that there is an app that can do this for you. You can make all of these that you like, right? You can make one of these right now if you wish. Um, and not to impugn Mr. Robinson's journalism, but what did he say afterwards? Oops. Might be fake, but the sentiment isn't. This is an appeal to the emotional effect of uh, of, of the song. Now, again, I'm not saying he did anything wrong here, but this is a very, very powerful point about how what seems to matter here is not the truth, but the fact that the emotion is shared. This, this runs through the entire narrative about how people are dealing with news in the hyperpartisan environment. And, uh, and that's the answer I wish I had for you. But we'll move on. I'll just keep throwing stuff at you so you forget that I'm not fulfilling the deal here. Um, I'm also going to show you two pages of one long, continuous quote. Um, and I've made a whole bunch of links here for anybody who's interested. They're all the same, of the same format. They're just numbers. Um, this is from uh, Mark Little, who founded a site called Storyful um, in a Neiman report that's linked there. Um, and the emphasis is mine. We're going to come back to these sort of point by point. <coughs> This is kind of the whole problem in a nutshell, this and the next slide, um, and I won't bore you by reading, uh, reading these things out, but ad-based model, rewarding emotion, collapse of trust, too much information, and on that too much information point, um, uh, the cognitive shortcuts that fuel our biases. These are what's at work, and I have some more pop psychology for you, and I can certainly give you links to even more of it, um, but it stands to reason 
we didn't, you know, develop on the savannah ready to deal with a, you know, tweet storm. Right? This is, this is what we're experiencing here is at least in part a reaction to just too much stuff coming at us. Um, and this bit, this is actually the, the sleep losing point. My dispassionate voice, no match for the passion, and we'll really come to this, outsource our new supply to neighbors, friends, and family. It's not just from, it's not the one to many, right? It's not the newspapers, the yellow journalism or the good kind. It's from everywhere and from everyone. Um, so let's go through it, point by point. Um, near perfect environment for fake news. We have built, come out one. Um, we have built an attention economy. Uh, my business is doing better than your business because I get more retweets, there's more likes on, on Facebook, there's, there's more YouTube views. Um, you guys heard of the uh, Macedonian teenagers who were just pumping out fake news during the American election? Everybody heard about that? Um, what are they doing it for? I'm reliably informed that, you know, part of it is just for, for laughs, right, for the laws. Part of it, though, and a big part of it for a lot of people, just like newspaper people, right, is making money. You can make thousands of euros a day pumping this stuff out by, you know, getting in with, with ad networks. Just make stuff up, get people to click it, that's enough, right, without any commitment to the truth. There's an entire, um, very healthy economy of this stuff, and these kids exploited it. Um, uh, there's another point about uh, James McDaniel from Underground News Reports, did the same thing, ended up feeling bad about it. Um, and so he's going to give the ad money he made to the Democratic National Committee. <laughs> um, uh, audience participation time, who has heard Filter Bubble? Okay, the idea um, is that, so there used to be a uh, tried and true cheap journalist trick to start your piece uh, with the, you know, this is what happens when you Google something tells you what the autocomplete would suggest, and that's who's supposed to tell you something about the world, or these are what the first results are. You can't do that anymore. I could carry this audience participation business to a logical conclusion and get everyone to Google something, but take my word for it. Um, unless you're, you know, if you search for something quite general, I don't know, apples, colic, whatever, um, you will get a different set of results from your neighbor. Um, this is a, a target business. They are relying on their secret sauce algorithms that are uh, tapping into your Explicit preferences, you will reveal preferences on the basis of, uh, of things that you've liked and done before, drawing information from all sorts of sources, uh, and lots of things being sort of shared behind the scenes. They have a profile of you. Um, and so it knows what you're looking for. This is damned handy in a lot of cases. It knows that I'm looking for this particular thing about colic, say. Um, also, targeted ads, it's the very same story, but in sort of ad form. And the, uh, the spooky element is the, the dark ads business that has been uh, sort of invoked. Um, with regard to elections and the like. There is a uh, company called uh, Cambridge Analytics. Anybody heard of them? They have, um, they've been uh, lauded or lambasted, depending on your point of view, for um, the efforts that they put into the, the Trump campaign um, and are, investiga are under investigation for allegedly providing uh, illicit services to the Leave.eu campaign. This is powerful stuff. Um, and it is all on the basis of data that's out there and that's being, you know, is being used to give you a different experience. There was, was a time that <coughs> television adverts, we could all see them. We could, they were all kind of part of a common discourse. Uh, we would see the same newspapers on the stand and choose among them. We could talk about what was in that newspaper. But now, it's you, with your phone, on the tube, looking at something that's made just for you. This is, you know, this is clearly affecting the, the way we're dealing with how we, how we talk to each other about these things. Um, <coughs> Atomization of news. Again, with the newspapers and the television ads, this is not how it happens. This is not how you get it. You get it in your Facebook feed, let's say. Tiny little pieces, and there's no visual cues, there's no contextual clues that you know, you've got something from Infowars, you've got something from the anti-vaxxers, you've got something from your Aunt Susie. It's all right there, it all looks the same, it's all equally clickable. It doesn't, it's sort of divorced from its context, and therefore you're left, <coughs> you're sort of deprived of some of the things that you would use to, to judge the merits, um, or, or indeed the truth of some of the stuff that you're seeing. Um, curiously, the effect of knowing that some of it is fake stands to reason, right? Some of it's just going to be complete nonsense, right? This makes people think that a lot of it is fake. Um, Facebook says that only a fraction of a percent of what they uh, are, are pumping out is clickbait and fake news. Notwithstanding the point that even if it were just that, that's still a very large number, and that these things take on a life of their own, these things are you know, disproportionately shared, if they're very evocative, 
um, it's you know it's uh, it gets magnified more than some you know whether it really was a genuine video of a very talented pug like these things <laughs> do take off um, and it's the interesting thing um, you know what you end up with is percent five percent on average people reckon about half this is again terrible news um, because <clears throat> Because in a world where you know we're not fighting, you know, we're, not, we're, not, we're not having the discussion about is this particular piece of news fake or not, we're just looking at in the round. Well, half of it's nonsense anyway. This is a, this is a terrible basis for sensible discussion about sensitive issues. Um, and as an aside, this is uh, a lot of the a lot of the fake news that Facebook talks about um, is not uh, this algorithmic bot stuff. This is not automatically created, you know, sort of targeted good code. This is people. They are, they're finding out that this is actually people in, uh, you know, committed to the various causes. The worst news is, as they do that and they create bad news, this also makes me cry. I did a lot of crying. <laughs> um, I shared it anyway! <laughs> so, I have no answer for that. Um, uh, issues of trust uh, that were mentioned before. Um, this is far and away the most interesting fact that I've seen um, in the research around fake news is that it doesn't matter the original source nearly so much as who actually posted it. Um, and to make matters worse, even if the original source as quoted is not really actually a news source at all, the trust is being invested in the person who's doing the sharing. Now, that's frightening and an opportunity. Um, we will come back to that. But let's go back to this terrible news. Um, there's been a slow slide in trust in media, and I apologize that these are overwhelmingly American numbers, but I think there's more American navel-gazing going on on these topics than there is here. Um, uh, the, the, the slide predated all of this. There's this sort of slipping sense of trust um, in the media, um, and that you know, kind of creates another facet of why it's easy for other stuff to jump into, uh, in, into the breach. <coughs> Um, and, and all of this kind of comes into an idea, um, kind of real uh, cocktail party phrasing of this. Uh, a guy called David Luverti works for Columbia Journalism Review, who I highly recommend on this topic. He says, there is no media, there is only my media and your media. The distinctions that we're making between legacy media and mainstream media and, and these sorts of things, it's, it's, that's not how people interact with it. They don't think hard about Aunt Susie or InfoWars or NBC News. They just think of... It's just that's where I get my news. I get a lot of my news from Facebook, actually. That's that's telling you everything about what they're not thinking about. Um, and also shocking, uh, this paper, um, again sourced, um, went about trying to find out kind of how people get their news and how they share their news and how they think about their news and so on. They started with online data from 1.2 million internet users. <coughs> Let me ask, uh, again with the audience participation business, how many of you uh, read 10 news articles yesterday? I did. All right. Um, and three opinion pieces yesterday? I think I did. OK. How about in the past week? 10 news articles and the three opinion pieces? OK. They had to cut out 96% of the people of the 1.2 million people, 96% of them, because they hadn't read 10 news articles and three opinion pieces in the past Three months. We have a lot of discussions about, like, uh, well, it was mentioned before, though, how, how can you not get this? How can you not understand? <coughs> it's because they haven't read the stuff. Journalists go busily cranking out a story a day, or eight stories a day, depending on where you're working, or, um, you know, spending weeks and months on, on uh, investigative pieces and saying, I've solved it for the world. I've figured out what the problem is. I've told you, here are the wrongdoers, and here's the way to solve it, and here's 8,000 beautiful words on it. It took me months. And people don't read it. And so we can't assume that people are working from the same basis of judgment that we are. So compounding the lack of trust, compounding the onslaught of stuff that people don't know how to parse, it's one of the reactions to that is simply not to read very much of this stuff. That talented pug is attractive <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a thing to do. <coughs> um, just briefly on this, um, we have mechanisms in place for, uh, for verifying truth, right? Behind the scenes, increasingly, sort of um, <clears throat> in plain view, lots of newspapers and, and websites have fact-checking teams, they have new Twitter feeds that say, you know, we've checked this fact for you and so on. There are a lot of issues um, with that uh, that sadly don't solve the problem directly. Um, we'll 
you're picking on my guy, or yeah, but, or yeah, but you didn't check this claim. Um, so we have, you know, the, the same sort of distrust that gives rise to the fake news claim actually perversely, ironically, cyclically undermines the attempt to fix the problem. <clears throat> I almost don't need to tell you any of this stuff <clears throat> because you know what it has to do with you. Um, a lot of this discussion has been around politics, um, and so it's, you know, it, it might seem slightly far away, but um, the the declining trust in science and experts. Uh, the, the, the fear and misunderstanding that, that Jonathan mentioned. Um, I think one of the misunderstandings, well, the, a misunderstanding can work in the other direction. People kind of do view uh, things, things scientific with a, a measure of fear, but I think a lot of people also think about science as a, uh, something with a kind of purity of purpose and something that is um, unfailingly reliant on facts. And they kind of forget that like all human endeavors, it's flawed in its ways. And so, yes, we're, we're seeing lots of news, and Retraction Watch will tell you all about the, the dodgy papers and retractions. Um, we hear all sorts of fun stories about predatory journals just taking people people's money to put absolute nonsense in, so people submit absolute nonsense, and sure enough, total gobbledygook goes in allegedly peer-reviewed journals. <coughs> this has a terrible effect, I think, on the wider public, because if we start with that understanding of, yeah, but scientists, they're just, they're nothing but the seekers of the truth, they're, you know, the, the, that, that purity of purpose, comes undone a bit, add that in with the sort of mistrust of, of experts that's kind of growing, and it starts to look like, well, science is just another one of these same problems. Um, certainly, bad medicine and Dr. Oz and uh, my own personal bugbear, Vitabiotics, and all, all the stuff that is, uh, you know, questionable. Um, climate change, obviously, a big one. Um, we could go on, but there's lots of stuff around the energy industry more generally. Um, the thing that uh, really sticks out, this was from, uh, from a memo from Brown and Williamson, then an absolutely you know, tobacco <coughs> company when things were just starting to come out. Doubt is the product. I hope you find that chilling. The idea is not to counter a fact, but simply to make the fact seem kind of shaky. This is exactly what people have been saying uh, the, the Russian government might have been interested in doing in the American election, not necessarily swaying it in a particular direction, but undermining trust in the electoral process that kind of doubt, to, to simply create some noise around it, to, to leave some room for maneuver, is all you really need to do. You don't need to plant a fake fact in somebody's mind, you just have to make them wonder just a little bit about the real fact. Um, now, so what's being done? Plenty of stuff. Um, we I reserve judgment on how useful a lot of, uh, a lot of the efforts are, um, because you know, it's, 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 uh, people are talking across purposes. There are plenty of sites um, and charities um, devoted to this. In the Ukraine, they've got a real problem with propaganda. So since 2014, they've had this um, stop fake news. Um, they have, the fun bit is that they have a news program um, developed which only includes, which absolutely exclusively includes fake facts. It's a sort of an entertainment program. Um, we're just going to feed you an entire news program done up by you know, somebody with the presenter and the, you know, the notes and the auto cue and the whole thing. It's all fake, on purpose, for fun. Um, Brazil, uh, one of their biggest newspapers, that are doing all the big, uh, breaking the big stories about the uh, corruption um, in the government there. They have a, an enormous um, fact-checking operation. All of this is good, can't argue with any of it. Um, and ultimately it's going to have to come down to hitting people where it hurts, which is, which is <coughs> money. Um, the big villains here in all of this have always ended up being Facebook and Google, who would really like you to believe that they're not media companies, and they know, I think, in their hearts that they are media companies and they, are, they do have to deal with this. Um, so, as of recently, there are um, some safeguards against posting a fake news. You might see this now if you want to post something other than pugs. Um, there is, uh, I don't know if we saw, everybody saw it in the newspapers, there were full page ads in all the broadsheets about tips for them. This is good PR for them, no doubt. See, we're tackling the problem. Nevertheless, if you read it, it's very good advice, all of it. I wouldn't argue. Um, <clears throat> and they have something called the News Integrity Initiative. The longer term plan is to, you know, inevitably to bring in <coughs> AI to solve this problem for us. But for now, it is just a bunch of humans who are compiling lists of dodgy sites, right? So. Um, efforts underway from them, from Google, as of recently, fact check tags. So if you want to, you know, if you start start a search, this is quite, this is obviously quite helpful. This is uh, this is a start. They've been thinking about doing this since 2011, but at the time they couldn't because there simply weren't enough fact checking, independent fact checking sites around. They've only launched it now because now there are. This has become a problem. 
you know, the, the solutions are kind of just now catching up with the problem. There are enough, you know, uh, there, are, there are enough people that they can quote third parties that they can say, hey, nothing to do with us, but just let you know that's already been proved false. Um, they have 10,000 quality raters, uh, allegedly from across the political and social spectrum all over the world, who kind of aid the, um, the, the algorithms and uh, tune things up because AI can't solve everything for us just yet. Um, they have been given new guidelines on, on fake news and how to deal with the stuff that they see as they kind of help train the algorithm. And where it will really hurt um, is kicking them off the ad networks, right? So you, you see mad, mad ads um, for things that are patently, you know, uh, well, for stories that are patently false, products that are sketchy. Um, the way to get um, at the economics of this, of course, is just to cut off the, the blood supply. Um, where I gain the most hope in all of this, when the crying finished, um, there are quite a few people out there um, who are taking it to the kids, basically. Um, Andy Oxman, who's now the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, has been looking at this since 2000. People are now paying attention to his work somewhat. Um, but just basically going into uh, going to schools, pre uh, providing uh, educational materials. Uh, the simple truth is that you can teach kids to be skeptical. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not hard to do this. We wait until fairly late in the, uh, in the, in the process of education currently, or have done, um, to, you know, start questioning things. It's a series of, you know, unending series of facts, and then later you say, well, but you're not always true. Start early. Simple as that. Um, and, uh, so, more recently, uh, Alex has done a, a study, um, with health information, um, in, I think it's the Gambia, um, and a Lancet study just came out um, last month showing that, sure enough, you teach them how to measure, uh, how to, to, to evaluate health claims, and they get better. Um, in Brooklyn, there's a school, uh, intermediate school 303, doing the same thing um, across several grades. Um, and the seventh graders are visibly better than the sixth graders, right? They're just like progressively getting better. Big spread in the New York Times about that. Um, this kind of, you know, this gives us uh, a bit of hope. I mean, in, in thinking about that narrative where, well, you know, the mode of communication changes and kind of the, the, the society kind of has to catch up with it, the kids are a, are, are a good hope, right? They're going to grow up in a world where this is already a problem, where you can't really judge uh, the, the good claim from the bad. Instilling a bit of, you know, not just cynicism, but healthy skepticism, I think, um, we're, you know, we're in an uncomfortable position, we're in an uncomfortable generation to be living through this change. And we, like you know, Harper's did, and like Jefferson did, are kind of we, we think it's all falling apart. Um, I would say sit tight, um, and I would be uh, honor bound to have a slide called <laughs> "What Can You Do." <laughs> um, I would say first and foremost, don't give up hope. Um, the the values are the same. The pursuit is the same. The uh, perils are the same. It's just the mode of news delivery that's different, radically different, importantly different, materially different. Um, but there's nothing to do but keep fighting the good fight, as far as I can figure. Um, I have been meticulously, and believe me, I did think hard about this, sourcing everything along the way. <laughs> um, even if the situation is that people will patently ignore the facts that you provide them and the uh, sensibly gather statistics that you, you know, put in a tweet and what have you, you are still obligated, I think, to show what you, you know, to, to say what, why you think what you think. The sourcing is the sort of the, the quantitative end of it. Here are the numbers that I'm working from. Here is the study that I read. Not only, like, read it and say it was this paper by somebody called Smith. Find it, find the link, link to it. Give everybody <coughs> a chance to see what you're seeing. Um, just make sure it's not behind paywalls, wherever possible. I think um, an accessibility of the information that stands up your case is now an absolute imperative. Um, another um, is make sure that what you think is what you should be thinking. Check these claims yourself. Um, there are more, you know, plenty of people, I, we're all news savvy enough in this room to probably do this for ourselves, and there are more resources as we've seen kind of, kind of coming up. But for God's sake, don't fall into the, 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 the trap of sharing fake news yourself. Um, if the, uh, if the suggestion is that it almost doesn't matter where stuff comes from, but rather who it's coming via, 
then you have a civic duty to share the good stuff, to call it good stuff, to flag it up as a particularly good example, to point out that this, you know, uh, stands up an argument which is clearly happening about some particular topic equally. When you see nonsense, call it such. We're in a very strange uh, situation where it, it used to be a major journalistic no-no to call anybody a liar. We are quickly getting to a stage where you kind of can, um, and that the, the it, I'm not going to make a value judgment about that, but newspapers used to dance around about politicians' fake claims. They kind of don't anymore. Now you can just say, that's nonsense. Um, you should too. Um, and uh, the important thing here, the, the um, I'll skip to the bottom of two here, uh, which I nicked from a piece on Vox by uh, Julia Belouz, which is very much worth reading. Um, <coughs> uh, the medical industry and how they've been dealing with fake news for absolutely decades. Um, we've we've heard already about the the role of emotion, and earlier uh, Jonathan was saying, you know, the, the the fight of heads versus hearts, and a lot of us are bringing heads to a heart fight, basically. Um, and so there is merit, and I'm not saying uh, make it deliberately, mawkishly, an emotional appeal, but make clear why you think what you think, why you feel that this is an important issue, why you feel those are doubtful data, um, and get out there and talk about it with people. Um, and one last thing, um, I, I don't think fake news is helpful anymore, especially with, with the way that it's being deployed now, so find other ways. It's been used so much now that if you use it, people won't take it for what you might mean it to me. So, call a lie a lie. Call a great truth a great useful truth. Um, and some handy URLs, some more to read. There's a lot of the uh, good pop psychology stuff in here. These guys are putting out story after story after story about fake news every week, many of them very worthwhile. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a massive report. This is the, this is the, the, the deep sociological study. Um, across kind of all uh, modes of, of use of fake news and how it's come about, and uh, the sort of the underground networks that produce these things. Um, how many in here know Nuzzle? It's kind of a curveball. Um, it is a service um, that you let into your Twitter feed, <coughs> and basically it does a digest of the tweets that were most active among the people that you follow, and to a lesser degree, the people who follow the people you follow, um, and it shows you. In essence, it gives you, let's say, eight tweets. These were the really active ones. 42 people retweeted this yesterday. It gives you a single link you can go to. You can see what the people you follow um, have been have been looking at. <coughs> Click one link and you can see everything they've said about that um, when retweeting or commenting or liking. Um, and it's, uh, in particular, if you have a diverse set of people that you follow, and I highly recommend that you do, don't get stuck in a filter bubble. Um, uh, it just lets you see the reactions kind of in one convenient place. Not only what's been most active, but how people have reacted to it. So you don't have to sort of scroll through everything or search for anything. It's just a digest that ends up in your inbox. Um, and I find it a really good way to, in particular if you're following a lot of people, just to get to what at least the people you follow think are the important things. And with that.